Hi doll friends, my name is Bradley Justice and I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit about Mego and their contributions to the doll market in the 1960s and 70s. The Mego Corporation was founded in 1954 by David and Madeline Abram. They pretty much produced all of those little dime store toys that we remember seeing on the hanging racks at like the dime store, the five and dime, just the inexpensive toys. But when their son, Marty, got involved after graduating from business school, he decided to take the company in a different direction and focus on doll manufacturing. One of their first contributions was an action figure called Fighting Yank. It was pretty much a complete knockoff of the um, G.I. Joe that was produced by Hasbro. So it was sort of action figure and dolls. So... Um, Hasbro sued them and they ceased production of it, but they wanted to kind of capitalize on that market and they started doing a doll called Maddie Mod, which was a fashion doll that was a Barbie knockoff and it had a fashionable wardrobe. They were pretty much exclusively produced in Hong Kong, so they were inexpensive and sort of a competitor that kind of came in at a lower price point than most of the popular toys. So... They decided in 1971 to sort of enter the action figure market. And since they'd already sort of had a battle with Hasbro, they decided to do things a little bit different. And they introduced an action figure that was called Action Jackson. And he was different because he was smaller. Coming in at eight inches tall, he was an articulated um, action figure and we use the term action figure because it was sort of derived by Hasbro when they introduced G.I. Joe because they didn't want little boys to play with dolls. So um, that's where we get that terminology. But he had all kinds of um, costumes that were sold separately that were military or sporty or adventure kind of driven. And they were lesser expensive than um, G.I. Joe and were sold at a lot of the um, stores like Toys R Us, Kmart, you know, that sort of thing. Um, they were fairly well done based on the price point. They were, um, had lots of little accessories and stuff. My brothers and I actually played with Action Jackson when we were little. We had a bunch of them because they were affordable and inexpensive. But they wanted to capitalize on the girl market. And in the early 1970s, one of the things that was going on, even in the world of Barbie, there wasn't as much a focus on glamour as there was on popular sports and activities and skiing and that sort of thing. So they decided to create a female version of Action Jackson with a doll called Dynamite. So Dynamite was about the same size and she had an articulated body. Here is one that's undressed. And um, she was, you know, articulated all over. And they did clothing that was, she could go parachuting, um, she could go scuba diving. It's sort of a fabulous scuba diving costume. Um, and, um, but, you know, they did, you know, fashionable things like here's her wedding gown. And they also did a few little um, sort of work-a-day kind of things, like they did a nurse's outfit for her. So she had a variety of um, wardrobe choices and, you know, sort of play patterns that you could create. You know, also with, like, the nurse, if your brother was playing with his Action Jackson and there was a battle and someone needed to be taken care of, you know, Dynamite could sort of step in and take over. Um... She was popular. They kind of did a whole world for her. Now, the interesting thing was it was a different scale than all of the other action figures and dolls available at the time. It was smaller, so there wasn't a whole lot of swapping around. So you were kind of pigeonholed into, if you were going to buy this doll, you had to buy all of the clothes from this company because they were the only game in town making them this scale. They did sort of like a cabana house for her that she could be at the beach. Here is like a little mini bike or sports cycle that they created. I think it runs on batteries. I mean, they did a lot and it was more an outdoorsy, fun kind of girl action figure. Um, they did a version of her in African American as well. And um, she's kind of cool. She has a little cool afro. 
Um, the version that I showed you this way was sort of like the spa version, and she came with like a little um, spa club where she could exercise and that sort of thing back when that kind of started. But they were fashionable, they were affordable, um, and they were fine. Nico was sort of like on the, the brink of great success, and this was not a success for them. It really was kind of a flop. It kind of ended up um, sort of run amok, and it ended up in a lot of discount stores and that sort of thing because it was not the industry standard. You know, Barbie, 11 and a half inches tall. You bought a Barbie, you could get a knockoff outfit. Everything kind of worked with everything else. So this was introducing a whole new scale. But even though it was a flop, they got one good thing out of it. They got a generic body for both male and female that they could use for their next introduction into the toy world, which they refer to as the greatest superheroes of all time. So they received the license from DC Comics and Marvel to create all of the superheroes, Batman, Superman, Spider-Man. And so they were all done on the generic body. So all they had to do was a new head sculpt, swap it out, and come up with a costume. This is what the male body, body looks like. But they used the girl body for Wonder Woman, Batgirl, and all of the female superheroes. So... It was not completely lost. So let's take a peek at some of the dynamite fashions that were available. The package on the back actually illustrates 21 fashions that were produced and documented on the package. However, I'm aware of at least two or three that don't show up on this package. This fabulous sort of checkerboard Harlequin print um, lounge outfit comes with a little plastic television and is really kind of cute. Um, has bell-bottom pants and kind of shows that it was she was a fashion doll even though she was very interested in being sort of an action sort of girl. So the next fashion is sort of like a winter coat ensemble with tights, a hat, and boots. These boots turn up and often people think they're the same boots for the Catwoman action figure that were produced by Mego, but they're actually kind of different. And this is her Western costume, complete with cowboy hat and boots. And at a time that Westerns were really, really big, and um, that whole sort of out West kind of look was going on. And as I pointed out, you know, there was like a nurse's costume, which, you know, showed she was a career girl as well, and added to a play pattern, much like um, the other action figures. And this one is not shown on the back of the package. It's sort of like a mod sort of poochie print with sleeves. And it just, once again, it's like a formal that kind of shows that, you know, there was fashion involved in this. It was really kind of a, a cool, cool doll of the moment. Now, this is just kind of crazy. I mean, like, when I think of the early 70s, I always think of the Brady Bunch. And to me, this is something that Marsha Brady would like you know, go to school in. It's, you know, it's crazy flower bell bottoms with like a fringy top and, you know, little boots. So once again, a fashion look instead of an action look. Now, this is when she decides to go skydiving. It comes with like a parachute backpack and like a windsuit. It's really almost military looking, but it's very chic at the same time. And... I don't know what sort of look this is. It's kind of crazy. It has sort of like an open sort of hat and um, um, crazy tights and tennis shoes. It's, you know, I don't know if this is perfect for skateboarding or going shopping, but it's sort of a sort of a wild and crazy sort of look. It's kind of fun. Now, this is like she's like a folk singer. She's got crazy bell bottoms and a guitar, so she can... Um, perform a concert or lead everybody in a sing-along by the campfire when they're camping. It's kind of a fun look. And once again, a sort of fashion look. This one also is not featured on the back of the package. 
Um, this particular fabric you'll see reoccur in some of the Maddie Mod fashions that were done at the same time. So some of these fabrics you'll see in other dolls and toys that were done by Mego. Mego enjoyed an enormous success with the <clears throat> action figures um, when they did the superheroes. And so these kind of went by this, the wayside. But they still enjoyed doing a lot of clone fashions. So this is featured on the back of the package. It's kind of a, a fun pantsuit with um, jacket and scarf and a little plastic hat. And then this is sort of a neat formal. Like she's going to go to the Kentucky Derby to see some horse racing. I like this sort of black and white look. She could be going to Truman Capote's black and white ball. So, I mean... It's very chic and very of the moment, sort of Stepford Wives. Um, these are all kind of fun fashions. You know, she could go skiing. There was the wedding gown. There's scuba diving. And probably my favorite was the sort of racing suit. I think it's kind of fun. It's um, just very chic yet um, dual purpose. So I think it's sort of cool. So... Um, Dynamite was Dynamite because she was fashionable, she was fun, um, she encouraged outdoor play, she was just kind of a cool doll. Um, I really love her. I hope you've enjoyed this collection that's sort of a slice of the early 70s and a peek into a doll that maybe you didn't know about. So I hope you enjoyed. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification button.